we've been involved with broadcasting for uh, nearly over 80 years now, and we currently can offer pretty much the whole chain. So right from ingest <laughs> via the camera into uh, studio server-based systems, play out, encoding, multiplexing, the transmission side, of course, and test measurement and monitoring. And we can offer network management solutions for the whole system. And for standard definition and high definition, there are quite a large number of these types of installations around the world. So the new one is to move on to HPC and 4K. So what is 4K? Um, there's a number of different variations on 4K, which is why DVB actually talks about ultra high definition. So UHD 1 and UHD 2. So there's no confusion, but there still is a lot of confusion in places. And really the big difference is 4K is usually a binary 4K one way, whereas UHD TV is twice HD in each direction. So the numbers are slightly different. There's also variation for 8K, and this is UHD 2. And generally speaking, we normally talk about uh, four times HD in both directions again. The thing I like about UHD 2 is it includes 22 channel audio. <coughs> which is a nice number of speakers to have around your room. You can build a, a room or a house out of your, your HDTV screen in a few years' time. Uh, of course, this is a lot of data, and this is the first problem you have. Uh, it's made even a bigger problem because we have extended the color space with ultra-high definition. So it's not just more pixels, the bigger and better pixels. Uh, generally speaking, we're talking about 10-bit, but we're going to 12-bit in RGB, and there's also 444 uh, space with 12 bits and four different color channels to improve the quality of the image as well as the resolution of the image. So the big scramble at the moment for the TV set manufacturers is to go from HCTV color space, which is the little bit in there, to the ultra high definition color space, which is even bigger. More resolution, more bits, improved color, improved information. And if that wasn't enough, on top of that, we're going for higher frame rates. So not happy with just 25 frames, uh, looking at 100 frames per second, 120 frames per second for the states, and uh, even up to 300 frames per second. Uh, the improvement you get with the high frame rates is substantial. So these are pictures that from BBC Research, for example. So 300 hertz, you can read the images uh, at the lower resolutions, lower frame rates, you can't. So it's a lot of interesting stuff that's going on. So we're doubling the size in each direction, we're increasing the frame rate, not just twice, but maybe four times, so even eight times the frame rate as well. What does this do to your bid rates? It gets pretty big pretty quickly. So this sort of summarizes the main ones. So 10-bit 420, uh, going to even 12-bit 444, and 10-bit 444 four resolutions, you start getting up to 96 gigabits per second. So that's raw data rate out of the camera. That's a lot of bits. Um, we have solutions for that, the Clipster has been used in the film industry for many years, so for things like 3D uh, stereoscopic filming, things like The Hobbit, we've been used as the main source to capture off the cameras there. The other problem of course is how do you actually physically move 96 gigabits per second and beyond? And there's a range of solutions that we've come up with, uh, if we just start down the bottom, HD, SDI, one and a half gigabits per second, nothing. 3G SDI, 3 gigabits per second, doesn't even start to carry uh, ultra high definition. All the way up through here, we've got new standards coming out 6G, 12G, uh, 24G HD SDI signals. Uh, there are some standards for that, but at the moment, there are almost no equipment that supports it. And nobody really knows what the right solution will be. And if you go to the top, you're talking about having Optolink 24G. HD SDI, so that's eight cables, each carrying 24 gigabits per second for the highest resolutions that you might come up with. Fortunately, we're not working up at that level yet, so most of the systems require the 12G UHD SDI type signal. But again, there are almost no solutions available. So what most cameras currently support, you have the 4K camera and it splits it up into four sectors and you get one 3G SDI signal for each of the four quadrants coming out. So you have four cables coming out of the back of a box, out of the camera. As long as you keep them all fully synchronized all the way through, it can work correctly. 
but if they all have a different time basis, you find you get mismatches and you can see the, the areas where they stitch together. So careful monitoring the signaling, the timing, and of course the recording device, in our case the clipster, uh, is required to make sure you don't get some fairly nasty artifacts appearing in the compression system. Um, so what do we, how do we actually compress it? Um, the answer is the new standard, H265, or HEVC. Um, there is an ISO number for it, but there is no MPEG-5. If any of you want to know what happened with MPEG-5, uh, ask the standards committees why they went from MPEG-4 to MPEG-7. So well, I don't think we'll see an MPEG-5 standard. But HEVC has been around for a while. It was ratified in January last year. They just had some updates to the standards uh, to include some different bit rates, different sizes, and support for interlaced video as well. Its design goal was to get to 50% less bitrate than for H.264, and more or less it's got that. Um, somewhere between 45 and 50 is relatively straightforward to achieve. There's some signs that in some cases you can get a little bit better. I've heard reports of things like 52, 53%. So it really is delivering the half the bitrate that it promises. And for those of you who remember when MPEG-4 came out, everybody claimed 50% bitrate reduction over MPEG-2. In most cases, it was closer to 20, and even today, it's still only about 30, 35% for the high-end systems. But pretty much from the beginning, HEVC is delivering 50% more or less. But it really tackles it in two ways. One is just to improve the compression efficiency, if you like. So if you go from an 8x8 macro block to a 16x16 16 or to a 64x64 64 macro block, you get improvements, economies of scale effectively come into place. So HEVC defines a 64x64 64 block size, and that's much more bit efficient than 16x16. 16 16. It improves the uh, uh, motion vector options. So in MPEG-2, you loosely have, speaking have just two reference frames that you can use. In MPEG-4, that went to four reference frames. In H.265, you can have a list of reference frames as long as you want to make it. There's issues how you manage it, and that's a challenge for the encoder manufacturers, how to actually manipulate some of the techniques that are coming out. But it's very, very flexible indeed. Overall, this sort of technique gets you about 35, 38% more bit rate. But the clever bit, they've improved some of the picture quality uh, issues. So those of you who are familiar with MPEG-4, there's something called the in-loop deblocking filter, which improves the visual quality, that's what you the, and the viewers want to see, even to the expense of the PSNR value. And they've taken those basic concepts and applied it in a different way and improved how that works. So that's why we talk about sample adaptive offset. And loosely speaking, if you have a part of the screen that is all blue, you can improve the efficiency and the quality of that by applying this color blue, if you like, to a much larger area that's related. And that can also feed back into some areas with motion vectors. So if an area that's mainly blue is moving across the screen, you can, and I'm using very loose term, track that area and you get the color benefits as well as the motion vector benefits as well. One of the other things, which again is the big challenge, particularly for some of the traditional ways of doing uh, the encoding, um, they actually give you some very nice ways to do the encoding and for the decoding. So it's more into processor intensive, you need more processor power for HEVC, no doubt of that. Unfortunately, you also need it for the decoding side. But to make it easier, they've actually defined ways you can specify to the encoder that makes it easier for the decoder to operate. So it can be optimized for mobile phones, used for things like graphics processors in a PC or in a graphics uh, card, um, and even to enable you to choose which sector that you want to decode. And particularly important in some application, very low latency <coughs> decoding. One of the targets for HEVC is surgery. And the last thing that you want to have is a remote surgeon saying, now make the cut, and it delays by about half a second or something from where you're actually doing. It doesn't tend to work very well. It gets a bit nasty. Okay, how has it actually got there? I'll just show this very quickly. So this is the standard slides. Uh, of the processor uh, uh, bitrate performance improvements. So H.262 is the MPEG-2 standard, uh, MPEG-4 part 2, and then H.264 2002, and the new one, H.265, is really delivering somewhere around about there. So very high performance indeed, and again, loosely speaking, halving the bitrate with each iteration of the processors. 
Uh, I said parallelism, though, is very important for HEVC. It's how we can actually achieve some of the, uh, uh, the fast decode and fast encode times. Uh, I won't go through all of these. Again, those of you who thought you knew MPEG-2 and MPEG-4 were familiar with slices and uh, pictures, you've just got a whole new vocabulary to learn. There's a whole bunch of new names for a lot of things that are probably familiar to you if you knew what they were. Uh, we still have things like slice structures, but we also have things called tiles, and you can use a tile to specify how you're going to encode a part of the screen, which means also if you have a quad processor in the decode side, you can decode that tile with that processor. So it really makes it much more efficient if you have a multiprocessor system. Uh, so these are slices and tiles. Again, the really critical thing here is you can define it in different ways. So I can have one processor encoding that part, another processor encoding that one, and then on the decode side, they can operate completely separately, and you get real parallelism in the decode. And this is why things like Samsung TVs that were launched more than a year and a half ago, they can actually decode HEVC from June last year because they have relatively low processing power, but they have a large number of processors inside the TVs. Uh, so this is one way of doing the encoding. So 3G uh, signals come out of a 4K camera, uh, four 3G SDI for each of the quadrants, and you can assign one processor if you want to, to each of those tiles to be able to do the encoding very efficient way of doing it. There are different options and different people do it in different ways. I'll give you a hint, we don't actually do it that way. Uh, we do a different technique. But that's the very simplistic way of starting off. Uh, you can actually extend this if you've got a lot more processors inside the system. There's something called wavefront power up processing. And again, loosely speaking, you set one processor, one thread, if it's software, a real physical processor in other cases, and it does a line of macro blocks across the screen. And it basically gives information to the next thread underneath it to allow it to start at the same time, that encode or that decode process. So you end up with a very fast decode system, and it depends entirely on how many processes that you apply to the encoder and assume you're gonna have in the decoder itself. So very low latency decode times are possible there. Uh, I said, this is the sort of standard bit rate reduction you get, 1920, 1080, and the bit rate more or less halves. I said, we've seen some signs you can do a little bit better than 50, but 50 is a good working percentage to aim for. Um, where is it going to be used? Of course, the big one we're talking about, which I'm talking to you about now, is for ultra high definition TV transmission. So 4K by 2K is starting now. There are uh, three or four test channels you can receive at the moment in Europe and a few others around the world. Uh, we showed complete end-to-end -end solutions for 4K HEVC at NAB this year. We've also seen other applications for standard definition and high definition in HEVC. We heard about it earlier in Germany. They want to launch DVB-T2 using HEVC for SD and HD. And, of course, mobile TV and internet TV, low resolution solutions, again, that will be part of the mix. If you can double the number of channels or halve your transmission cost, that's going to be a win-win for content providers as well as, hopefully, consumers who want to get in on the act. Um, so, what is our solution? Uh, well, it's the ABHE 100. The clue was in the title of the presentation there, of course. Uh, the Advanced Virtual HEVC Encoding System. So we've been uh, done, doing a number of tests with this over the last few months with different people. Um, it's based on our existing head-end solution, just a bit more power, new processors. And for those of you not familiar with our virtual head-end software system, um, it does real-time MPEG-2, real-time MPEG-4, 4K, HD, and SD video. And of course, now we've added the DVB, uh, the H.265 as well to it. And in software, just in the one probe server, we can do a complete head end. So that's from getting content in, obviously encoding it, multiplexing, and the DVB-T2 gateway, SF and adapter, scrambling if needed, uh, and we have full seamless redundancy and switchover. We can actually have failover, and we don't lose even the SFN signal, and it's all done in software. Uh, basically, our aim is to say, here's your server, 
uh, you have a network somewhere. Our cross-flow IP technology controls the movement of data within that system, guarantees the timing, guarantees redundancy, guarantees that it's seamless in the case of an error. Um, so the performance at the moment with our AVS 100, and we've got new versions coming out later this year, uh, five HD encoders or 10 SD encoders in a one high <laughs> unit. We believe that's pretty close to the highest density that you can get um, in that size. But that also includes the multiplexer, which you probably won't get in other systems. It also includes the SI generator, which is usually an add-on to other systems. It also includes the SF and adapter T2 gateway. That's a big other box that you have to buy, again, all in software in the system. Seamless redundancy is included, and a head-end management system to control it all. And that's all in a one height unit system. Want more encoders? Stick another box on. Want even more encoders? Stick another box on. You're getting the idea. You want HEVC? That, just have the software upgrade, and you can do HEVC for the same system. So that's the approach. All software, virtualized system, um, very efficient. Uh, we were then chosen to broadcast a football match the 26th of April by Munich against Werder Bremen. We're Munich-based companies, I'm sure you know, so they were playing at home in the Allianz Arena, so we did the uh, live transmission. So we were live, first live on-air transmission of a football match in 4K via satellite. Roland Schwartz equipment. Um, I think it's fairly obvious 4K and up to HD TV are becoming very widely accepted. Uh, HEVC is the only way, realistically, with those bid rates, we're going to get auto HD transmitted anywhere, and HEVC is the solution for that. Uh, we're the leader in 4K in the studio area. We've been the leader in 4K in the film area for post production for a while. And with HEVC, we've got a number of real firsts behind us. So first real-time showing of HEVC, SD and HD at IBC, complete end-to-end -end solution, NAB, and just recently, first live football matches.